Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today, there will be zero duplicate injuries in this episode because we're just doing a kitchen makeover. And it would be pretty difficult to injure a duplicate just doing a kitchen makeover. So I'm giving you my echo stamp of guarantee that there will be no injured dupes in the recording of today's episode. Well, there's always a chance because we have to tame this gold volcano. Because if you remember, we we're going to put a thermo aqua tuner inside the enclosure with this gold volcano. And that thermo aqua tuner was going to provide the cooling for our infinite food storage. I also figured it'd be great to have another set of hands before we start on the kitchen. So we're going to welcome this Lyra here. Once again, we're adding another rancher because we just have so many critters. But they also can do some tidying and decorating in their off time. Their only disadvantage? A little bit of an irritable bowel. Welcome to the colony. J Ray. Now, the infinite food storage brings up an interesting point. Right now, we have 425,000 calories, and there is no possible way our duplicates are eating all those calories before they end up going off. But that actually serves to our advantage because whenever food does go off and turn into a rod pile, it's brought over to this conveyor loader. It then gets sent down here to eventually turn into polluted dirt, where the auto sweepers eventually feed it to the sublimation stations, which provides oxygen for our beautiful colony. Which gets me to wondering, how much rotten food would it actually take to provide oxygen for an entire colony? So it's one of those cases, do we really want to lose access to that rotten food? And I'm going to say yes. Just because we can store and keep an infinite amount of food deep frozen doesn't mean we have to. For instance, we could say any and all barbecue doesn't go in the infinite food storage. But we'll figure that out later. The one holdback for today's episode is going to be that thermo aqua tuner because we need to tame this gold volcano. And before we can do that, we need to empty all of this water. Now we're trying to make it go as fast as possible by using two liquid pumps. The systems are fairly simple. We have liquid filters here that send all the clean water to these two liquid vents and this storage here, whereas all the polluted water gets dumped into our large polluted water tank that eventually is gonna be drained because we're feeding it to our arbor trees. By the way, doesn't our new Wild Arbitrary Ranch looks so good. I suppose we could put the Thermo Aqua Tuner in there now. We don't necessarily have to wait for all the water to leave. And the Thermo Aqua Tuner would just dump the heat off into this amount of water, which it would not be able to heat up before it was drained. I mean, that's one option. The other option is we could put the Thermo Aqua Tuner in here. The disadvantage of that being the liquid pipe run to get to wherever we plan on cooling would be a lot longer. But then again, we could use the thermo regulator. There's not as many gas pipes. By the way, since we're over here, I did want to highlight that we extended our power spine. We grabbed it from the industrial sauna right here in this vacuumed part of our double liquid lock. Now the heavy watt wire extends all the way up this side as well. And I believe I promised myself in one of the last series, one of my goals was to get heavy watt wire all the way around the outside of the map. That way it's easy no matter where you need to put a power transformer. Step one when we're trying to design our new kitchen is going to be location. Ideally, you want it to be close to the Great Hall because when the duplicates come grab food, they then head to the Great Hall and you don't want that trip to take too long. So I think we've decided on this level here. The only disadvantage is the printing pods on this level, and you can't move the printing pod. Hint, hint, Clay. It'd be really great to be able to move the printing pod. But I have an idea to fix that as well. First, let's get rid of all these triage cots. We won't be needing them. We're also not going to be worrying about research in this episode, so we can get rid of all those as well. We'll probably end up moving research over to this side once we have the new kitchen all up and running. That's another thing I wish Clay would add. More rooms. It'd be really cool to maybe get another speed bonus when you're in a room properly designated as a kitchen. You could have the requirements of the room be the electric grill, maybe a light, and a refrigerator. And you could either be rewarded with the speed bonus, or maybe all cooking done in a kitchen reduces the amount of germs generated. I don't know. But I think after I'm done recording, I'm going to go check Steam for a more rooms mod. And of course, right after I removed all of our research machines, I decided I wanted to make sure I future-proof the kitchen and put a gas range in there. And now we have no research buildings. Give me a second. All right, that's much better. Now research can commence. Speaking of which, this is one of the first playthroughs I've actually had multiple researchers 
doing research at the same time. You don't have to do it because it is somewhat wasteful, but being able to knock out all three stages of a research at the same time is pretty cool. I've decided on the thermoregulator for a couple of reasons. One, we don't need a ton of cooling potential. Two, the thermoregulator is only 240 watts. The run's not too bad. Starts at the thermoregulator here, goes up out of our industrial sauna, and then it ends up in our kitchen somewhere around here. I left the pipes undone because I'm not exactly sure where it's going to finish off. But speaking of power, we've pretty much fixed all of our problems. After some playing around with the thermo sensors, we settled on 250 for this one and 225 for this one. In fact, we might raise this just a smidge more. And you can see these steam turbines are giving us great wattage. 850, 850, 790, and this last one 725. But we did have to break in there off camera. Reason being, this area was heating up too much because the steam wasn't really flowing around like it does everywhere else. So we moved our liquid lock to the petroleum boiler and strapped in the steam turbine right above it, and it's venting right over the cobalt volcano. Since we're in there, we added some more rail runs in order to more evenly disperse the heat around here. This area gets hotter because it does not have all the cooling potential that this area does. And ideally, this setup wouldn't have looked like this. We'd have had all four of these steam turbines way up here, and this just be the giant steam room. But space constraints being what they are, I don't mind this. And we are taking out that power very slowly. We have this smart battery set on 9050. So it only kicks in after the petroleum generators and the natural gas generators over here. The one pain I'm still working with is there's a ton of abyssalite still on these rails. And as you know, abyssalite does not transfer. So every once in a while, once I'm confident it's been cooled down enough up here, I just flip this signal and send it through our chiller anyways. And then I let it take as much heat out of the non-abyssalite materials and then I dump it all right here. So that's something else I'll be working on in the background. During all that off-camera time, I also tamed this copper volcano. There was nothing spectacular about it, and it's the exact same system we've done multiple times in this series already. The copper gets ran around through these rails. Man, I'm really loving these debris chillers. And we have it set on 25 degrees, and it all gets dumped off here. And I realized when I started seeing cobalt that I had not put a tile under this chute. But then it got me realizing I never added a debris chiller onto this cobalt volcano. So all this cobalt that's coming out of here is only going to be down to 125 degrees. Well, that is until now. We've now integrated both of these volcanoes to this one debris chiller. So now the cobalt will come out of here. This conveyor shut off will let it out when it's under 125. And then it'll take the track through a little bit of rail spaghetti and then onto this line here where it will be integrated with the rest of the copper trying to be chilled down. And metal volcanoes, they don't spit out a lot of metal at a time. So it's very rare that these two metals are actually going to be on the rail at the same time. Unfortunately, we are going to be bleeding a little bit of that heat out into this environment here and a little bit here. Although there's enough cooling being provided in front of the steam turbines where this is not going to matter too much. So this area here might get a little warmer, but I don't think it's going to be enough to offset the temperature of the oxygen because again, it's not going to be a lot of metal passing over that rail. We're now in the process of building the deep freezer. I love being able to corner build this stuff. It makes it so much easier. No liquid locks or anything are even needed. Of course, that sedimentary rock is going to bother me for just about ever. I suppose what I can do is put another tile right over it and it'll remove that sedimentary rock. It's funny, they can put materials in there, but they can't take them out. Okay, I am a giant silly because when you deconstruct the tile, I'm given that same sedimentary rock. <laughs> Didn't think that one through. But eventually, we're gonna have an auto sweeper, and the auto sweeper will have no problem getting the stuff out. Now, this is the prime design point for your kitchen. You need an auto sweeper that's going to be able to hit that freezer in order to be able to provide the grill and the oven all the cooking materials it needs. Likewise though, this auto sweeper shouldn't be able to see the conveyor loader that's going to be responsible for putting everything in the deep freezer. In fact, I think I can thin that out even better by putting the conveyor loader sideways. Yeah, auto sweeper still can't see. Another auto sweeper positioned, say here, can't reach the deep freezer, but it will be able to reach the conveyor loader. Okay, really? 
We can build everything inside here to include the rail, but we can't build the conveyor chute? That is obnoxious. I'll deal with you in a second. So as I was saying, the big limiting factor in your kitchen designs are these two auto sweepers. One to get in the deep freezer and the other one to grab the ingredients. Because if we, for instance, put this auto sweeper here, both your gas oven and your grill need to be in range of both auto sweepers. That way all the ingredients can be loaded up by this auto sweeper and then all the finished products can be sent away using this auto sweeper. There is one workaround though. We could put another conveyor loader, say here, put a bunch of rails on it and have all the ingredients be loaded into conveyor receptacles. And that way you could have your kitchen a lot further away from your deep freezer. For instance, let's say we have an auto sweeper here with an electric grill right there. What we're looking at here is how much food is gonna be sitting here on these rails before it gets cooked. And I'd venture to say with a couple of cooks cooking pretty much full time, I don't think it's a big deal to worry about. So I think we're gonna do a mix of the two. We'll have the grill a little bit further away to give us more room for activities and maybe the gas range right here. The gas range will be able to get all of its ingredients directly from the freezer. The electric grill will need some conveyor receptacles. And the great thing about having them set up this far apart is one light is gonna be able to illuminate both cooking areas. This setup should work well. We'll be able to throw as many ingredients that we want cooked on the electric grill into this conveyor loader. We may still get the occasional raw pile because things sitting in the conveyor loader too long before being cooked, but we don't mind rot piles too much around here. Those are little nuggets of oxygen. I was clicking over on Frostbane and realized something. We already have a J-Ray. Here's J-Ray, and here's the imposter J-Ray, aka J.M. Mort. Sorry about that, J.M. We're putting in a tiny little liquid lock just to be able to get in here to remove this conveyor chute. You remove all the oil except for the little bit sitting right on top of this one. So when we've removed this tile, no gas is going to get in here. We'll be able to work around it and then hurry up and build this tile back. At least that's the theory. Look at this. We have a vacuumed out area that we're able to work in. And now we have the conveyor chute that apparently was too big to fit through the corner. And we just build the insulated tile back. Nice and easy. Lamb and... Oh. Well, let's try something else, shall we? The oil was supposed to go up, not over. All right, let's try this again. Now when we deconstruct these, no oil should fall. Or at least if it does, it'll be so small it won't go over into this tile. Look at that. Beautiful. Just as long as no one exhales right there, we'll be perfectly fine. And we have success. Third time's a charm, huh? Now we need to load up our coolant line. Well, it just so happens that we have a little bit of hydrogen being created over here. We'll just disconnect it from the canister filler and load it in directly like this. We have a little bit of cobalt ore here, so as soon as these critters decide to eat, the slug plugs will create some hydrogen, just like this. It'll get filtered through this gas filter, and then head over to the coolant line. It'll take a little bit, but no big deal. And the great thing about hydrogen is you don't have to worry about making it too cold. So we'll start off with, say, minus 25. If it's above it, the thermoregulator will cool it down. We'll see if it'll be cold enough at minus 25 to make the trek all the way over to here, where it has to ultimately be minus 18. The last thing to move is our evolution chamber. Now the evolution chamber doesn't really have to move. We could just ship all the meat directly from here right over into the deep freezer, but I'd rather have the lobster tank in the kitchen per se. That ought to work just fine. Now all we have to do is transfer all this food and the eggs. We'll put a quick conveyor loader here, send everything here. The ingredients and the completed food will be grabbed by this auto sweeper and sent through this conveyor loader. So for temporary purposes, we'll just select all edibles. Then once all that's out, we'll change this conveyor loader to only taking in completed foods like barbecue or fried mushrooms. Otherwise, this auto sweeper would take all the ingredients being provided by this conveyor receptacle and keep sending them back to the deep freezer. Unfortunately, this auto sweeper can't see these eggs, so we have to do a little bit of a home renovation here. And away they go. Look at all the sage hatching eggs. 
And that's because those are the only ones we were actually using the evolution chamber for. We used to manually be moving all the pip eggs and then creating omelets. We don't want to do that anymore. Which means it's time for yet another solid filter. And eventually we're going to need to do a massive renovation on all our giant rail systems. Because this is starting to get ludicrous. But the things on this rail right now already are lumber and dirt. Now we're going to be adding critter eggs to it. Which means we're going to need two filters in series. So why don't we take the other one, put it right here. Actually, I think I like them better like this. So they can go out from one right into the other. So we'll put them here. So now everything's going to come in here. And if it meets its filter criteria in the first one, it'll come down here. Otherwise, it'll go straight over. Then we have the second. Ah, we're actually going to need a third. And while we're working on this, we're going to separate these rails. That way we don't get things in the wrong spot. For instance, critter eggs in here. First one, we'll sort out the dirt. It can come straight across over here and link up where it was heading originally, and that's to be dropped off to our stage hatches, which means we can also remove all of this mumbo jumbo. The second one is lumber. It will go straight through here and head off into our ethanol distillery plant. And then last, we'll grab all of the eggs and have them meet up right here. Now we're going to save this one because eventually we will also take out all the eggshells and the eggshells will be sent over here. Now it's time to transfer all of our standard ingredients. All the eggs have been grabbed so we can unselect critter eggs and select all of the edibles. Everything will head over there. But before we send everything into the deep freezer, we need to provide an atmosphere there. Otherwise, something's going to go off and then it'll be polluted oxygen inside the deep freezer and not the preferred chlorine. Unfortunately, we don't have any bleachstone on our main colony, but we do have some on Frostine. So we will steal all their bleachstone, and then we have a couple containers underwater that will store all the bleachstone, and we'll just take a smidge and put it right into this conveyor loader, which I suppose we can drop all the edibles for now. And since we're not moving those critter shells yet, we're just going to connect the end line into the same line with all of the critter eggs heading over here. The question is, now that I have that filter system, can I remove some of this? And with our deep freezer nearing completion, we can actually drown all the slicksters now. We're helping this process by adding more oil to this container, and now there is a mass culling. We started off with over 200 critters, and that number is going down pretty drastically. All that bleach stone is being sent over to our home colony. And just in case any more is created, we can unselect it there. And then we'll put a little bit of bleach stone right into the conveyor loader, allow manual use, and that way we can turn this vacuum into a germ-killing chlorine environment. 139 kilos is probably a little bit of overkill. It'll take a little while for that to off-gas, but you can see the chlorine is climbing very quickly, which means we're ready to put food in here. We have everything we have in the colony sitting in there which can be very dangerous because the duplicates don't have access to that quite yet. We need to finish the loop here. All the completed foods are going to end up in this conveyor loader, which means we'll reset it here. We'll say barbecue and some fried mushrooms. Everything else that we end up cooking will just stay in there until we need it. But then we need something to load up all the ingredients from here. Most of the meat is actually probably going to be transferred directly from this spot into this electric grill. But all the fried mushrooms, we don't want them waiting around until there's availability here. That's easy enough. We will just add a few more auto sweepers to the chain. I mean, what's just a little bit more rail, huh? No big deal. Now the last step, other than waiting for our freezer to get down there in temperature, is to get a refrigerator loaded up. We're going to say, let's eat all of the fried mushrooms first, but we only want, say, five kilos loaded at a time. This way, the duplicants will come grab the food and the auto super will load the refrigerator back up once it needs to. And this way, the food doesn't spend much time at all outside of the deep freezer. We'll also add barbecue and that way we don't have to worry about when the fried mushrooms run out, we'll still have plenty of food to load up in the refrigerator. So far, this is a working kitchen. Now, we have a storage bin set on a priority of one that is picking up all the rot pile out of the deep freezer until it gets down to freezing temps, which, based on the condition of our cooling loop, is going to be a little while. But this conveyor loader is responsible for loading up all the ingredients that we're going to be cooking. For right now, that's just mushrooms and meat. 
and all of it will sit in this conveyor receptacle until this electric grill calls for more ingredients. Might help if I actually selected regular mushrooms instead of fried mushrooms. Okay, I'm tired of waiting. We're gonna take matters into our own hands. There's more than one way to create hydrogen in this game. We'll put an electrolyzer right in here. We're also gonna add some automation to it, so anytime we need some hydrogen, we can flip this switch. It would also help if we put our standard manual airlock right here instead of the pneumatic door. So this is its own closed system. And then we will deconstruct this standard vent and put a high pressure gas vent on there. And that way when we want hydrogen, we'll get hydrogen. This is more like it. We're filling the coolant loop up pretty quickly and we're driving down the temperature of our deep freezer. Right now the chlorine's at 24 degrees and falling. Our coolant loop is completely full, which means we can remove this gas bridge. And now whenever we need some fresh hydrogen, We'll have plenty. And what's great is we now have a little pocket electrolyzer. The dupes aren't allowed into this room, and whenever we need a little bit of hydrogen, we just turn the whole system on. We even put a water tank here, that way we'll have five tons of fresh water. So long after this place is all empty, we'll still have a little bit of water, just in case we need hydrogen in the future. And what's better is our hydrogen is now chilled down to minus 25 degrees, which means we have a working deep freezer. It still has a little bit ways to go because there's a lot of food and everything else in it. You can see the food items themselves are considered refrigerated right now, not deep frozen, but we're getting there. Some other nifty innovations we've made is we put the refrigerator right inside the great hall and this auto sweeper can see it perfectly. That way, whenever duplicates need food, they'll run over to this fridge. If any of that food ever goes bad, put in our garbage can right here, whereas a duplicate will come and grab it eventually. Thanks, Andy. We have a second refrigerator here just in case we ever need something out of it. For instance, we have 40,000 calories worth of pickled meal. And if we're going to space and want that pickled meal, we can just click edible, select pickled meal, and the auto super will throw all the pickled meal in the refrigerator, and then our duplicates can do whatever they want with it. Our duplicates, when they're idle, they like hanging out right here. One day I'm gonna figure out why duplicates do the things they do when they're idle. There's always that one or two locations in a map that the duplicates are just gravitated towards. Eventually we'll have a nice rec room and they'll go hang out there. There's one last little thing I wanted to do to make this kitchen 100% proper. And that is to add some decor. I mean, who wouldn't want to eat in this great hall or cook in this kitchen? It's absolutely wonderful, isn't it? Next episode, it's space. And unlike in my other series, I can guarantee we'll make it to space this time, partly because we've already been there. We'll start exploring more of the map, and to start off with, we need to figure out where our main spaceport's gonna be, where all the other colonies are gonna reach back to for their supplies. Frostine's got plenty of room, but I don't know what kind of advantages that gives us, possibly because it is directly connected to our home planetoid by these dupe teleporters and the supply teleporters. I'm not 100% sure. We have a lot of options though. Oh yeah, and by the way, we were able to record this entire episode before this tank was emptied out. Saved myself a ton of time and power by just using a thermoregulator. Finally, all the food is now deep frozen, which means all that's left to do is, is watch that calorie count climb. I'd love to hear what you think about the strategy on the spaceport issue. Should our home colony be a spaceport or should it be a distant planetoid that we haven't found yet? Let me know in the comments below. By the way, if you've watched all the way to this point, go ahead and give the video a like. You know you enjoyed it. I had a great time recording this episode. I know the dupes did too because no one got injured. Well, at least that you saw. Until next time, I'll talk to you soon.